Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Natalia Moczulska and this is the news. Prince William is on a visit to Poland. Today he met, among others, with Polish President Andrzej Duda and Ukraine staying in our country. The visit of the heir to the British throne began yesterday with a meeting with Polish and British soldiers in Rzeszów. President Andrzej Duda's meeting with Prince William focused on security issues. The Prince of Wales thanked the Poles for taking in hundreds of thousands of refugees from Ukraine. Earlier, he laid wreaths at the tomb of the unknown soldier. This is an unannounced visit to Poland by His Royal Highness. Yesterday, Prince William and Rzeszów met with British soldiers stationed at the 3rd Subcarpathian Territorial Defense Brigade. I just want to come here in person to say thank you for all that you're doing, um, keeping everyone uh, safe out here and keeping an eye on what's going on. So um, just a big thank you for what you do on a day-to-day basis. Um, and I know some of you are coming to the end of your, your time out here, so looking forward to a bit of r and when you get home. Uh, but you're doing a really important job out here. and. Defending our freedoms is really important and everyone back home thoroughly supports you. Foreign media outlets highlight that the British prince's visit comes just after Chinese leader Xi Jinping's trip to Moscow and sends a strong message to Putin's criminal regime. Prince William is the first member of the royal family to meet with British soldiers in Poland. For several years, the British have viewed the issue of security similarly to us, and their presence both in Poland and on the eastern flank is therefore not accidental. What's more, this cooperation of ours is practically in every field. Prince William met with refugees from Ukraine who have found refuge in Poland. From the very first days of Russian aggression against Ukraine, Polish society has opened its hearts and homes to mothers and children from across our eastern border fleeing war. There were moments as early as the first days of March when this influx of refugees to this section of the Polish-Ukrainian border was very large because daily up to 80,000 people. The number of British soldiers stationed in Poland has increased in recent years. In addition to rotational tasks carried out as part of the NATO alliance, British engineering troops supported Polish soldiers while protecting the border with Belarus. Just before the Russian aggression, London sent additional forces to Poland. This brought the number of military personnel to more than 600. The British, along with the French, are the two countries that have a significant army and are able to realistically help the Ukrainians, whether by sending equipment or training Ukrainian soldiers or also through intelligence support. Poland has recently concluded a number of arms contracts with the UK. We work very closely with the British side when it comes to the programs that are being implemented, such as the NAREV program. Meanwhile, an air alert was declared across Ukraine today. One person died as a result of yesterday's Russian missile attack on Zaporizhia. 25 of the wounded are in hospitals. Missiles hit two eight-story apartments. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the Ukrainian army will not leave any Russian attack on Ukrainian cities and their residents unanswered. Zelensky also met with Ukrainian soldiers near the front, near Bakhmut, where he presented them with medals. He also visited a hospital where soldiers wounded in combat with the Russians are recovering. Earlier today, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited the southern region of Kherson, where he toured local infrastructure and promised to restore everything following Russia's invasion. Today, I have been working in the regions all day. Donbass, the front line, our soldiers, the region, then Kharkiv region, the situation in Kharkiv on the border in all districts of the region, recovery, defense of critical infrastructure. I started from the front, from the Bakhmut area. It is an honor for me to support our soldiers who are defending the country in the toughest frontline conditions. I presented state awards, thanked our soldiers for their bravery, for their resilience, for Ukraine, which we are protecting thanks to such heroes, thanks to each and everyone who is fighting against Russian evil. It is painful to look at the cities of Donbass, to which Russia has brought such terrible suffering, the ruin, the almost constant hourly air raid siren in Kramatorsk, the constant threat of shelling, the constant threat to life. It is there in Donbass, in the Kharkiv region, wherever the Russian evil has come that it is obvious that the terrorist state cannot be stopped by anything else but our victory. And we will ensure it, the Ukrainian victory. The Ukrainian counteroffensive last year pushed Russian troops out of the regional capital, Kherson, after months of occupation. Workers in the region are now busy restoring power and the water supply. 
Zelensky has visited frontline troops several times during the war. Wednesday's visit followed days after Russian President Vladimir Putin went to the city of Mariupol, his first to any Russian-occupied part of Ukraine's industrial Donbass region since the war began, and the closest he has been to front lines. The two-day summit of European Union heads of state and government began today. Poland is represented by Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. One of the main topics of the talks is increasing the production of munitions and delivering them to Ukraine. Poland will seek an additional 240 million euros in European Union funding to refinance military purchases for Ukraine, the Polish Prime Minister said earlier today. Poland has already received about 200 million złotych to refinance arms purchases for Ukraine. We want to obtain 240 million euros, another billion złotych over the next couple of weeks, likely coming to Poland, I think, before Easter. This is an uncommonly important issue. Also speaking outside the EU summit, Finland's Prime Minister Sanna Marin said leaders would have to discuss ways to boost Europe's arms and ammunition production capacity. Marin also said Finland hopes hoped to become a NATO member soon and added that her country would work to support neighbor Sweden's bid to join the alliance. To speed up uh, the European capabilities when it comes to these equipments and one of the topics will be how we can boost uh, the European uh, capabilities uh, providing uh, and uh, producing uh, arms and, for example, ammunition. I think it was very important uh, decision that was made uh, earlier this week that we will provide Ukraine uh, more ammunition uh, that they really need uh, every day. We will hope that uh, within near future Finland will become a member of NATO. Uh, of course, I want to highlight that Sweden also fulfill all the criteria and they should also uh, become members of NATO very fast. Finland will do utmost to make sure that Sweden will also become a member of NATO as soon as possible. Experts say that despite the recent banking sector crisis in the United States, inflation remains the greatest near-term threat to the economy, and taming it is still the most critical priority for the Federal Reserve. The Federal Open Market Committee of the U.S. Fed announced on Wednesday that it would raise the target range of the federal funds rate by 25 basis points to between 4.75 and 5 percent, the highest level since October 2007. It marks the ninth consecutive rate increase since March 2022, or the first rate increase after the collapse of California's Silicon Valley Bank has triggered a wave of volatility in the global banking sector. The Silicon Valley Bank, the 16th largest bank bank in the United States was closed on March 10th by regulators due to insolvency, according to the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Noting the climbing U.S. federal debt, McCormack said that the U.S. economy is expected to slip into recession in the second half of this year. So we should expect interest rates to continue, we think, to rise from here, which is not yet fully resolved and we don't know the extent of how far that will spread. But that's a different set of policy tools. That might not be interest rates. So government debt in the United States is well over 100% uh, of GDP. We have it at 115% of GDP. The global average is about half of that. Unfortunately, we don't see much of a, a strategy or a plan from the government to, to address its very high debt levels. Even using the government's own forecast, the debt-to-GDP ratio will continue to rise uh, for the next 10 years. We think there will be a recession in the U.S. in the second half of this year. This was before there was any uh, turmoil in, in the banking system. So that was just based largely on higher interest rates. And as the Fed continues to raise rates, you know, that has an effect on the economy. Despite the recent banking sector crisis, the Fed has signaled that its battle against persistent levels of inflation must go on. The committee reiterated that it remains highly attentive to inflation risks. I expect interest rates that banks pay depositors are likely to have to go up, uh, while government bond rates will fall as depositors become more aware of their available rates and risk options. This could place some downside pressure on banks' net interest margins that could drive uh, more consolidation within the industry uh, and less credit expansion in the economy. 
Global market strategist for Asia Pacific, David Chow, predicts that the negative spillover effects of the U.S. banking turmoil will impact the European banking sector and the European economy. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please stay tuned for Poland Daily Weather, Poland Daily Business, and some of our other programs. But for me, it's have a wonderful evening.